birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. It is actually rather reassuring to witness institutions from across the world coming together to deliberate about the thoughts and ideologies of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, one tends to you know, go back to his writings to seek answers to contemporary questions, such as the relevance of his work. Tejpur University, in association with Queen's University and Indian Community Centre Belfast Ireland, have come together to remember this great man today. A warm welcome to you all to this webinar titled Mahatma K. Gandhi, Reflections from Beyond the Past and into the Future. I take immense pleasure to welcome Honorable Vice Chancellor, Tishpur University Professor V K Jain, our chief guest Lord Diljit Rana, and our distinguished speaker Professor Thomas G Fraser, Professor Chandan Kumar Sharma, Professor Devarshi Prasad Nath, and Professor M Satish Kumar. Uh, in I. Without much delay, I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Sir, Professor V. K. Jain, to inaugurate the webinar with his inaugural address. Over to you, Sir. Thank you, Dr. Namami. <coughs> Honorable Lord Diljit uh, Rana Sahab, MBE, Chairman and Chief Executive Andras House Group, Northern Ireland, Professor Tom Fraser, Emeritus Professor of History, Ulster University, Northern Ireland, UK, Professor M. Satish Kumar, School of Natural and Built Environment, Queen's University, Belfast, Professor Chandan Sharma, Head Department of Social Work, and Professor of Sociology at Tejpur University, Professor Devarshi Nath, Department of Culture Studies at Tejpur University, faculty members, representatives, and members of Indian Community Center, <coughs> Belfast, and all the participants from abroad and India. Uh, on behalf of Tejpur University and on my personal behalf, it's such a pleasure and honor to welcome you all this afternoon for the webinar, Mahatma Gandhi Reflections from Beyond the Past and the Future and into the Future, which is being jointly organized uh, by Queen's University Belfast, Indian Community Center, and Tejpur University. Uh, by way of introduction about Tejpur University, may I just mention that Tejpur University is located in northeastern part of India. Uh, it's in the state of Assam and is one of the premier uh, institutions in the field of higher education in India. These celebrations. Uh, hope to familiarize one and all, and especially the students about the values which Gandhi subscribed to, so that each one of us becomes an agent of peace, harmony, and equitable world order. With your permission, may I just give a brief glimpse of Gandhi's uh, life's journey which will tell you that his early childhood uh, was very ordinary uh, from a very orthodox Hindu family in the state of Gujarat in India, where our current prime minister also hails from. Uh, Gandhi was a very average student in his early schooling and college life. He had the opportunity to go to England, got his degree in law, came back and uh, when he was just about to start his career as a barrister in India, he got this offer to go to South Africa, and then the rest is history. Uh, three uh, major instances uh, while he was in, in South Africa uh, actually changed him uh, in a very profound manner. Uh, 
it was you know rampant racial discrimination he personally faced in fact in one instance he was pushed off uh, the payments uh, which were which were meant for the whites only uh, in another instance when he went to just visit a court he was asked to remove his turban and that famous or uh, infamous incident when he was thrown off a first class compartment uh, from a from a train uh, and to so these uh, and uh, some other very very discriminatory laws against the blacks and and the asians uh, actually um, changed him completely thus began his career as a formidable crusader for fighting racial discrimination and oppressive colonial rule in south africa and in india and then his eventual evolution into a very noble soul on whom people of india conferred the title of mahatma he was such an extraordinary uh, human being that albert einstein the famous physicist uh, had said generations to come will scarcely believe that such a one is this ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth uh, after india's independence he did not assume any position of power uh, in government also it would have been there for his asking he was uh, well ahead of his times his thoughts inspired many old leaders and continue to do so they had huge impact in the century uh, gone by and they are very much relevant today and would continue to be relevant in future to we have to address some of the pressing challenges uh, of this century uh, gandhi's uh, cardinal principles and his faith in uh, non violence compassion for all peace and justice and his views on uh, role of science in progress of humanity good governance development environment empowerment of people and uh, life of dignity for poor are are too well known and, and so relevant in the contemporary context in fact if you look at the the uh, the concept of sustainable development all the sustainable development goals and majority of them would find some common thread uh, about these uh, uh, in the goals and what he actually uh, propagated um <laughs> gandhi had this unshakable faith in oneness of humanity as evident from from this stream of court if humanity is to progress gandhi is inescapable he lived thought and inspired uh, by vision of humanity evolving towards a world of peace and harmony we may ignore him at our own peril um with these words i welcome you all to this uh, webinar um, and uh, i hope that uh, Uh, this webinar would be a great success, and I look forward to listening to all the keynote speakers. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, especially for reminding us those instances actually which contributed to the making of the Mahatma. Though we have all read about those incidents and we have heard about it many a time, but every time we hear it, it, it you know, uh, it never fails to inspire us. So with this, uh, thank you very much, sir, for that. With this, we move on to our next session, and uh, we are uh, honored to have amongst us a remarkable past personality who has made an eternal impression of India in Ireland through his hard work and commitment. We welcome our chief guest for today's webinar, Lord Diljit Rana, to talk briefly, to give a very brief introduction of Lord Diljit Rana, Baron Rana. 
He is a successful businessman in Belfast, Northern Ireland. He is chairman and chief executive of Andra's House Group, Northern Ireland's biggest hotels and hospitality organization. Born at Sangol in Punjab, Lord Rana has lived in Northern Ireland since 1966. He was appointed to the House of Lords in 2004 by the then UK Prime Minister, Mr. Tony Blair, in recognition of his work. He drove the successful regeneration of Belfast city centre and made efforts to encourage political dialogue which led to peace talks in Northern Ireland. He has served the Government of India as Honorary Consul of, for India to Northern Ireland from 2004 to 2012. During this tenure, he has actively promoted business, education, political and cultural links between India and Northern Ireland, leading to a series of business missions from Northern Ireland to India. Due to his efforts, India is the second biggest investor in Northern Ireland next to United States of America. Many Northern Ireland companies have set up businesses in India as well. He was awarded the most excellent order of the British Empire, MBE, in 1996. He is the first ethnic businessman to be elected president of the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce, the region's biggest business organization. He was the driving force in what became known as the Golden Mile, the entertainment heart of Belfast. He is the founder and funder of a charitable education complex in Sangol, his birthplace in Punjab, India. We are very honored to have you amongst us today, sir. I request you to kindly present your welcome address. Sir, over to you. Sir, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, you've been very generous in the introduction. Actually, I'm at the Sangol Education Campus. So, my greetings from Sangol to all the scholars gathered this afternoon to talk about Mahatma Gandhi and celebrating the 50 years of his uh, birthday. Um, Mahatma Gandhi's name came into my vocabulary as a very young boy in 1946-47. Of course, we all know about partition of India in 1947. And uh, I overheard my father and some of his senior colleagues criticizing Mahatma Gandhi that at this point when there were riots happening all over, my parents and I, we were in Lailpur, which is now called Faisalabad, which is part of the Pakistan. So we were caught up in the riots there we didn't leave until September 1947. And when we left, we boarded the train which was overcrowded. It was attacked by gunmen three times. Uh, Any of we survived, ended up in Ferozpur and then to a ancestral village in this Kedushya. So coming back to the topic that uh, some of my elders at that time and his friends were critical that after partition or before partition, Mahatma Gandhi did not use his influence to have an orderly movement of people from one part of India to the other part of India. And we all know how tragic it was. Maybe two million people died, millions became holy. So that was the first introduction, my introduction with Mahatma Gandhi. Then as a teenager, I was given by one of my relations his autobiography, my experiments with truth, 
which I read with great interest, and it affected my thinking as a young student at that time. So I became more or less a Gandhi. But later on, uh, we think that Gandhi was a great man, no doubt about that, his unique personality, as the professor quoted in, in the filmmaker, saying that people will wonder in coming generation whether such a man ever existed on the surface. But one of the problems that we have that he is given too much credit for achieving independence of India. And some of the other people, like uh, Subhash Chandra Bose and many others, are overshadowed <laughs> and not giving credit to their uh, sacrifices for getting India's independence. The phrase from a film, Sabar Mati Ke Sant Ne Kar Diya Kamal. I think that has to be read and taught with other sacrifices which happen. Actually, the independence of India really start from the struggle Maharaja Pratap and then subsequently Guru Gobind Singh Ji. Guru Gobind Singh Ji particularly fired the sense of pride, the sense of fighting against injustice uh, by instituting Khalsa and the sacrifice of his two sons being killed, changed the whole thing. So his sacrifice on the west of in Punjab side and uh, Shivaji Maratha sacrifice really brought the demise of the Mughal Empire. So we need to give credit to those people uh, there were, I think, 123 people who were given capital punishment by the British for uh, fighting in whatever way for the independence of India. Of those 93 of, of India. So it's a great sacrifice that uh, Indian National Army under the leadership of Subhash did. And the other contributing factor to our independence is really the two world wars, First World War and the Second World War. The transition of power from the British to the Indians, as they call natives, began during the First World War and it accelerated during the Second World War. The demand of the war in the Europe in the First World War and Second World War, the contribution of Indian soldiers, but more so, it, uh, the transfer of power, as I said, moved from the British in the civil administration, in the army, in the air force, in the navy, from British officers to Indian officers. So at the end of the war, it was really became impossible for the British to hold on to them. But the transfer had happened already. So this is where 
I think one of the memos from Earl Monk Batten, who was a viceroy of India at that time, to the then Prime Minister Clement Attlee, saying that if we don't trans transfer power now, in six months' time, we'll have nothing to transfer. So this is the aspect that the First World War, Second World War, and the sacrifice of other people contributed to the independence of India. Gandhi played an important role, not belittling his sacrifice. But I think it has to be, he has to be given credit on, along with others for what happened or it happened. Then in the present era now, after 40s, 50s and 60s, Gandhi's message world over, or in India, is really lost. Uh, nobody is saying we should not have weapons. Nobody is saying we shouldn't be close. So the world is a troubled place as much as it ever was or maybe more. So it's a, it's a sad thing that uh, Gandhi's message is not carried out. I have lived in Northern Ireland for 52 years. And during that time, we had a very major terrorist campaign where IRA and the British administration forces, police, they had a pitch battle in Belfast, in London, Northern, and all over Northern Ireland for 25 years. So at the end of the day, it was uh, talking to each other which brought uh, peace in Northern Ireland after nearly 500 years. So the British started taking bit by bit colonizing Ireland in the 15th century. Uh, so I played an important role in 18th, bringing people together from opposite sides and uh, hosting dinners for them to encourage them to start talking with each other. And it worked. So I did that for some time. And later on, other people got involved. So this is where the message, what I have changed, that Gandhi's message is important, that the violence does not give any long-term solution to any other problem. So we need to bear that in mind. And I hope in the university, colleges, schools, we need to bring this message that if peaceful talks at the end of the day, sitting together, talking about problems, find the solution to any problem. Violence gives temporary solution, but not long term. Look what happened in Europe. They killed millions of people in early last century, in the First World War, Second World War, and eventually they had to get together. And now the whole of Western Europe is like my country. So there's a lesson there that we could connect Gandhi's role with finding solutions. So thank you. I look forward to other contributors' views on the subject. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Rana. Uh, for highlighting the key qualities of Gandhi that has been forever inspiring. Also, the doctrine of non-violence, which is it's so important in today's day and age, but uh, people fail to connect to it. Uh, so it reminds me that, you know, such deliberations in platforms such as today's remains all the more imperative to connect to contemporary issues and keep reminding ourselves of Gandhi's vision.
of what a society or how a society should be like. With this, uh, I would like to move on to the next session. I'd request all the participants to mute their microphones. So in the next sessions, we have four distinguished speakers amongst us today from Tejpur University, <coughs> Ulster University, and Queen's University, Belfast. The speakers will engage with various aspects of Mahatma Gandhi's work and ideologies and its relevance in the contemporary times. Our first keynote speaker is Professor Thomas G. Fraser. Uh, to give a brief introduction of Professor Fraser, he, uh, Professor Thomas G. Fraser, MBE, is an emeritus professor of history at Ulster University. He was formerly the provost at the McGee campus between 2002 to 2006. He was educated in the University of Glasgow, where he studied medieval and modern history as a part of the master's program. He was also the recipient of the Ewing Prize. He went on to do his PhD in international history from London School of Economics. He was a Fulbright Scholar in Residence at Indiana University, South Bend, between 1983 to 84. He has several books, articles, and chapters on modern history of India, Middle East, Ireland, and American foreign policy to his credit. His book titled Partition in Ireland, India, and Palestine, Theory and Practice, 1984, it was published in, it was one of its kind. He is currently working on the history of the modern of the Middle East, the history of the Middle East since World War One. He is a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society. A warm welcome to you, Professor Fraser. I'd request you to present your address. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Sharma. I managed to press the right button for my microphone. Yes, we can hear you very clearly, Professor Fraser. Yes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> You're very kind. Uh, can I start, first of all, by saying just how much I appreciate the invitation to take part in today's event. It took me a bit by surprise uh, when my friend, uh, Satish Kumar, uh, extended this invitation to me. Why did it take me by surprise? Because when I first came to teach the history of India in 1968, 1969, what were we commemorating the 100th anniversary of the birth of Mahatma Gandhi? And now, half a century on, we're doing the same for 150 years. And I really do wonder where that half century has disappeared. But it's fascinating to look back uh, <clears throat> at many years at which I've had uh, occasion to look at a man who is not just one of the great figures of the history of India, which undeniably he was, but one of the great figures of the 20th century, and you yourself, Dr. Sharma, have just emphasized that, of the importance uh, of his message, which is not just for India, it extends far beyond that. <clears throat> when I had to think of a topic for today's session, uh, I thought I would address specifically the issue of how Gandhi handled and very reluctantly had to acquiesce in the idea of the partition of India. Because as Lord Rana has said from the heart, because he experienced it at first hand, the partition of India was one of the great tragedies of the 20th century. I have any number of books on the partition of India, and over the years we still don't really know the scale of that human tragedy. How many people were killed, how many people 
uh, were uprooted and to seek a new life elsewhere. So both Gandhi and Partition are topics uh, of universal, I think, importance. Partition intellectually, and this is what Gandhi uh, had to deal with in terms of his own ideology, essentially derives, as I'm sure everyone in the session is aware, from the two-nation theory. The two-nation theory, uh, as developed by the Muslim poet, theologian, scholar, uh, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. Now, Iqbal didn't really invent it. Uh, the idea had been around for, in one form or another for many years. We see it with Said Ahmed Khan in the 1880s, and it surfaced again in a wave of the Khilafat movement uh, in the early 1920s. But it was Iqbal who really brought it to the notion of the man who, how shall I put it, was the counterpoint to Gandhi, and that was, of course, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Now, this is not the place to do a brief biography of Jinnah, but the fact remains that by the late 1930s, Jinnah was, he was almost exactly in terms of age, the contemporary of Gandhi, but he was adrift in Muslim politics without any real and clear ideology. He had just presided over the disastrous performance of the Muslim League in the 1937 elections. <clears throat> well, what we have uh, summed up, if you can see it in this a uh, little booklet which I was able some years ago to buy in a bookstall, lucky enough really, uh, to, to buy in a bookstall in Mumbai, uh, along with a little collection of Muslim League and, and uh, Indian National Congress rejoined us for the Muslim League. This booklet, the letters of Iqbal to Jinnah, and they extend from May 1936 to November 19. 37. Sadly, Jinnah's replies uh, to Iqbal did not survive. But what we get from these letters that Iqbal was writing regularly to Jinnah is the core of the two nation theory which Jinnah was to adopt. What were Iqbal's arguments? The future advancement, he said, <clears throat> of the Muslims of India would only come about through a system of Islamic law. That would be impossible, he said, in this country, by which he meant India, of course, without a free Muslim state or states. It wasn't quite clear what Iqbal meant by the term state, did it mean a sovereign state or a state in the way that, for example, the United Provinces at that time was a state or Bengal. But he then went on to say, why should not the Muslims of Northwest India and Bengal be considered as nations entitled to self determination, just as other nations in India and outside India are. And let me pause just for a moment on that term self-determination, because it had been introduced into the political vocabulary at the end of the First World War by the American President Woodrow Wilson, and had been applied in states both in Europe and outside Europe after that. So what Iqbal is arguing, essentially, in this critical period, 
is that self-determination should be applied to the Muslims of India. Now that then formed, as we know perfectly well, formed the basis of the Lahore Resolution of March 1940. The resolution which set the All India Muslim League in a new direction, saying that the areas in which the Muslims are numerically in the majority, as in the northwestern and eastern zones of India, should be grouped to constitute, this was marked out in the text, independent states, not states within an All India uh, grouping, independent states, in which the constituent unit shall be autonomous and sovereign. Well, there, in a nutshell, is what confronted Gandhi as the accepted leader, which he was, of the Indian national movement in 1940. Gandhi had always responded to Muslim interests. Gandhi took the view that the Muslims were Indian as everyone else, and if an issue was important to the Muslim community, then it was important to him. And his a clear indication of that was his wholehearted support for the Khilafat movement of the early 1920s. He believed profoundly in religious harmony and in respect for what the Muslims of India wanted. Well, in response to the Lahore Resolution, he wrote a series of articles in his paper, the Harijan, in which he set out why he thought the Lahore Resolution was not the basis, and indeed were misrepresentation in his view of where the Muslims of India should be going. He started off by saying he would not coerce the Muslims, a statement which many of his supporters uh, were uneasy about. Why did he say that? Well, Madam Chairman, you have alluded to, the Vice Chancellor has, Bob Banner has, the essential principle that guided Gandhi's philosophy, and that was non-violence. He would not coerce the Muslims because of his fundamental, passionate belief in non-violence. But I then asked the question about the meeting at Lahore. There were, at that time, an estimated 80 million Muslims in India, where he said the 50,000 present at Lahore representative of these 80 million, and in their fair, in fact, very good reasons for questioning. More fundamentally, however, he argued that the two-nation theory was a fallacy. Why was it a fallacy? Because, he said, the Muslims of India had not become a separate nation by conversion to Islam. They had retained a common nationality. And this was to remain a basic plank with Gandhi, that the, the fact of conversion to a, a different religion, in this case, Islam, clearly, did not make you any less Indian. And therefore, there was no basis in his rationalization for the two-nation theory. And he then used a word which he knew would resonate throughout India. He said the Muslims would, in fact, repudiate the vivisection 
of the country. And that use of the term vivisection, I believe, was deliberate. <clears throat> well, of course, um, Jinnah's supporters uh, responded. His principal lieutenant, Liaqat Ali Khan, uh, wrote an article in the Bombay uh, Chronicle in which he came back at Gandhi and said, if the majority of Muslims supported the Lahore resolution, would Congress support them? Uh, and how could they demonstrate support? To which Gandhi replied in Harijan, the support could be shown in a constituent assembly, but he believed the Muslims would not do so. And he set out what was to be his basic position as far as partition was concerned for the next seven years. He would not forcibly resist partition, but he would not be a willing party to it. That was the nature of the discussion in 1940. We now move forward to 1944, uh, when Gandhi had been imprisoned as a result of the 1942 Quit India campaign and had witnessed the growing strength uh, of the Muslim League. He believed that Pakistan was a negotiating position that Jinnah did not really want to break up uh, <clears throat> India. And as a result, he ended in a series of correspondence and talks uh, between the 6th and the 27th of September 1944, which have come down to us as the Gandhi-Jinnah talks. And what Gandhi was trying to do and one of the sense he succeeded in doing was force Jinnah to recognize some of the contradictions. Let me come back in a moment. That was self-determination. Some of the contradictions in the Muslim League's position. He started off by stating in no uncertain terms that the two nation theory was invalid. There was, he said, no historical pattern for a body of religious converts being regarded as a separate nation. Furthermore, he said, and this was true, the word Pakistan did not actually appear in the Lahore resolution. To which Jenner replied that their history, beliefs, laws, language, and customs had made the Muslims a nation, and that Pakistan and the Lahore Resolution were one and the same. And here we come to the kernel of Gandhi's argument. Baluchistan, Sindh, Northwest Frontier Province, Bengal, uh, and parts of Bengal Assam and Punjab, where they were in an absolute majority, Muslims desired separation. In an absolute majority. Hence, he said he would recommend to Congress that if people in these areas voted for separation, two southern independent states could be established. Was this Gandhi conceding partition? Well, he then went on to say that even if two sovereign independent states were created, there would still have to be common defense, foreign affairs, internal communications, customs, and commerce. In other words, some form uh, of continuing government. Jinnah said no. There could be no common authority along the lines that Gandhi had said. He would not delegate the lifeblood of the state. And, and this was the kernel, he could not accept 
the partition of Bengal and the Punjab because that, in fact, is what Gandhi was saying. Uh, areas where Muslims were in an absolute majority. And here we have to pause and look at the demographics, which both venues perfectly well. And these are based on the 1971 uh, census of India, which I've rounded off a bit just for reasons of parity. But think of the areas that Jinnah was claiming for Pakistan. The northwest frontier province, 2 million. 200,000 Muslims, 143,000 Hindus. Clearly a Muslim province. But interestingly, in 1944, it was an Indian National Congress province. It had not swung to the Muslim League. Sindh, 2,800,000 Muslims as against 1 million Hindus. Clearly, again, a Muslim majority. Balochistan, by far the smallest, 400,000 Muslims, 41,000 Hindus. When you think of these figures, Northwest Frontier Province, Sindh, and Balochistan, doesn't actually amount to North and North. The key was the position in the Northwest, was the position of Punjab. 13 million 300,000 Muslims, a clear majority of the population. 6 million 300,000 Hindus and 3 million Sikhs. So, Muslims in a clear majority, but what of these large Hindu and Sikh communities? The last thing they wanted was to be part of a partitioned Muslim state. So if we then take the argument back to self-determination, if you are claiming self-determination as the basis of the demand for the Muslim state, where is the self-determination of the Hindus and Sikhs of Punjab? And that very same argument, it was exactly the same argument, uh, for Bengal, for the northeastern part, 27,400,000 Muslims, but 21,500,000 Hindus. It left the obvious question, self-determination for whom? And that's where the whole argument about the future of Punjab and Bengal comes to be at the heart, really, of the story of partition. Gandhi, in these talks with Jinnah in 1944, had put his finger on a key issue. What Jinnah was aware of, and what Gandhi was aware of, was not just the mixed population of Bengal and Punjab, but the historical, cultural, and economic cohesion of these two great states, the roads and the railways which bound them together. In Punjab, the great system of canal irrigation. In other words, Bengal and Punjab had histories of their own as well as the issue of religion. Well, the two men did not agree, but they had at least identified the kernel of the debate on partition. And when you look at the subsequent negotiations after 1945, the cabinet mission negotiations of 1946, you read exactly these issues being put forward, uh, and subsequently the plan that Lord Mountbatten adopted on the 2nd and 3rd of June, 1947. Now, the final point I want to make is, where did Gandhi stand in these final talks? 
he was by then a very elderly man. In some respects, he was out of the mainstream, but he was actually fully engaged and took a full part in the decision, decisions and discussions of 1947. When it came to the critical moment in Simla in the 2nd and 3rd of uh, June 1947, he was observing a day of silence, as he often did, but he acquiesced. And I put it no more strongly than that, he acquiesced in partition. And of course, it was a partition which went back in many respects to his talks of 1944, a partition in which Punjab and Bengal were themselves partitioned. Why did he acquiesce? Well, he left us some clues. He believed by the spring of 1947, no doubt, I have no doubt whatsoever, very, very sadly, that India had moved away from his principles of non-violence. We have all seen so far how important non-violence was for him. And he could see no way round the Muslim League. That's the way he put it. He could see no way around the Muslim League. So, as we have seen, Gandhi uh, came by 1947, however reluctantly, uh, <clears throat> to the position where he would not stand in the way of partition. And it brings you to this final sad and ultimately tragic period of Gandhi's life, of which we are all very much aware. Thank you, madam, for introducing me, and I look forward to hearing the other speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Fraser. Uh, when I was listening to your talk, a thought came to my mind, like in these current times, we are often faced with uh, misconstrued histories. In such times, your talk was very revelatory and was a work of true scholarship. Thank you very much for that. You actually, you maneuvered into those critical years uh, of partition and could show us the nuances of Gandhi's views on partition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so we move on to our uh, next speaker. I'm sure uh, our participants might have questions for our speakers. So we'll take all the questions in the end of the webinar. So you can write the questions in the chat box in the webinar. So we move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Chandran Kumar Sharma. He's a professor at the Department of Sociology and also heading the uh, Department of Social Work at Deshpur University. He actually, he has done his uh, graduation from Cotton College, a very reputed institution in Assam. And he went on to do his master's, MPhil, and PhD from Delhi School of Economics at Delhi University. His research areas include development, environment, urbanization, migration, and identity politics with special reference to Northeast India. He has widely published his works, both in academic as well as in popular fora. He is not only a regular commentator on the socio-political processes pertaining to the northeastern region of India, he has for long been engaged in various civil society initiatives as well in the region. Today he will be talking on Hind Swaraj and its contemporary relevance. I welcome you, Professor Sharma, to make your presentation. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Namami Sharma. Uh, esteemed Vice Chancellor, esteemed uh, Lord Rana, Professor Fraser, and my co speakers and friends. Hind uh, Saraj, as you all know, is widely recognized as the most important philosophical work of Mahatma Gandhi. But in his own word, the book, or rather, can be called a booklet has a 
checkered career. Uh, he first wrote a book while he was traveling from London to South Africa in 1909 uh, between 22nd to 27th November. Uh, and it was published in the columns of Indian Opinion, which was a multilingual newspaper published, uh, founded and edited by Mahatma Gandhi in South Africa. Uh, the book was written in response to Indian school of violence and its prototype in South Africa. While in London, Gandhi came into contact with every known Indian anarchist there, and while their bravery impressed him, he felt that their jail was misguided. He felt that violence was no remedy for Indians, India's ills, and that her civilization required the use of a different and higher weapon for self-protection. Here, he identifies non-violence as the most potent weapon. Since mid 1890s, Gandhi had been experimenting with non-violent resistance in South Africa, which he calls Satyagraha. And he was far of firm view that India was especially equipped to show the way out of violence through the higher weapon of non-violence resistance, violent resistance. So after Him Saraj was published in Gujarati, in the Indian opinion, it was so much appreciated that it was published as a booklet. However, the then Bombay government in India prohibited its circulation. Gandhi responded to it by publishing its English translation. The English edition was not banned by the English, who con concluded that the book would have little impact on the English-speaking Indians. Later, the book was also translated into French. Gandhi published it in English because he thought that it was due to my English friends, I am quoting Gandhi, it was due to my English friends that they should know its contents. In my opinion, it is a book which can be put into the hands of a child. It teaches the gospel of love in place of death of hate. It replaces violence with self-sacrifice. It pits soul force against brute force. The booklet subsequently went through several editions and also received serious criticisms during this period. But Gandhi was deeply convinced about his exposition in the book. And in his column in Young India in 1921, he wrote, I quote him, I withdraw nothing except one word of it, and that in deference to a lady friend, unquote. In 1938, the philosophical journal, the Aryan Path, published a special issue on Hinsaraj, where several well-known scholars, such as G.D.H. Cole, Middleton Murray, and others, presented their critics of the booklet. In his message to the special issue, Gandhi reasserted his conviction, writing, I quote, after the stormy 30 years through which I passed, I have seen nothing to make me alter the views expounded in it. Gandhi's insert takes the form of a dialogue between two characters, the reader and the editor. The reader assumes the role of the typical Indian countryman who voices the common beliefs and arguments with regard to Indian independence or Suraj. Gandhi, the editor, explains why those arguments are flawed and provides his own arguments. As the editor, Gandhi puts it, it is my duty patiently to try to remove your prejudices. Gandhi discusses many issues in 20 small chapters in the mode of this conversation. The core issues that run through the chapters include Gandhi's view on the nature of independence, that is Saraj, machinery and true civilization, the importance of passive resistance or non-violent matter, violent matters. By discussing those core issues, he throws light into many other critical issues concerning the contemporary Indian society. Let me discuss his views on Swaraj in, in this book. Swaraj is indeed, of course, in this book discussed on the backdrop of British rule in India. Gandhi argues that it is not enough for the British to leave only for Indians to adopt 
a British style society. As he puts it, some one English rule without English man. That is to say, they would make India English. And when it becomes English, it will be called not Hindustan, but English Khan. That is not the Saraj I want. Unquote. Gandhi argues that India will never be free unless it rejects Western civilization itself. In the, in the text, he is deeply critical of Western civilization, claiming, I quote, India is being ground down, not under the English hill, but under, the, under that of Western civilization, unquote. Not only is Western civilization unhealthy for India, but Western civilization is by its own virtue unhealthy. He at the same time argues that Western civilization is such that one has only to be patient and it will be self-destroyed. Extending this, extending this logic, Gandhi said that it was not the British rule, but the modern civilization nourished by their, by their rule, which was the real cause of economic distress, this poverty and unemployment. If father said, he quote him again, if the British rule were replaced tomorrow by the Indian rule based on modern methods, India would be no better. Against this, he envisaged India's salvation in the revival of its ancient civilization, which prescribes for men the path of duty and observance of morality. Here he discusses the self-sufficient and non-violent village society, which would only build, be built on the basis of, of cooperation and not conflict. According to him, as far as possible, every activity in the village would be conducted on cooperative basis. While this might look a utopian proposition, very interestingly, during the months of the COVID-19 pandemic in recent times, when supply chains throughout India have got disrupted, the government of India have also given similar call for revamping local economy. Now, coming to his emphasis on non-violent matter or passive resistance, as you call it. Gandhi rejects brute force and argues that Indian independence is only possible through passive resistance. He denounces violence as counterproductive. Instead, he believes, I quote, the force of love and pity is definitely greater than the force of arms. There is harm in the exercise of brute force, never in that of pity, unquote. Gandhi emphasizes that passive resistance is a method of securing rights by personal suffering. It is the reverse of resistance by arms. It is superior to brute force and requires more bravery, patience and courage on the part of its practitioners. When one refuses to do a thing that is repugnant to his or her conscience, the person uses soul force. What Gandhi says here is quite interesting. Everybody wants that, everybody admits that uh, sacrifice of self is infinitely superior to sacrifice of others. Moreover, if this kind of force is used in a cause that is unjust, only the person using it suffers. He does not make others suffer for his mistakes. Men have before now done many mistakes, uh, which subsequently bound to have been wrong. Sorry, uh, men have before now done many things which were subsequently found to have been wrong. No man can claim that he is absolutely in the right or that a particular thing is wrong because he thinks so. But it is wrong for him so long as that is his deliberate judgment. It is therefore indeed, uh, it is therefore needed that he should not do which he knows to be wrong and suffer the consequence, whatever it might be. This is the key to the use of soul force that he has been emphasizing. It is pointed out by scholars that non-violence is not the only reason that Gandhi wrote in Swaraj. And it is also true that the book's significance lies not only as an exposition of non-violence, although its importance can hardly be undermined. But if Hinswaraj occupies a seminal place in Gandhi's works, 
it is because in this world he initiated what he described in, uh, as a severe condemnation of modern civilization. Gandhi unleashed the most far-reaching critic of modernity that can imagine of the time, that one can imagine of the time. And though it struck many of his contemporaries as an absurd treatise, Ginsra strikes the reader of late modernity as a work of extraordinary prescience and insight. All too often, Ginsra has been read as a denunciation of the West, but this reading is nowhere substantiated by the text. Throughout, Gandhi remains clear that the replacement of white rulers by brown rulers would be of little consequence to the people if the new set of rulers governed by the same principles, with the same objectives, and with a similar commitment to principles of modern civilization. Gandhi has been criticized for his condemnation of missionary in the book. Middleton Barre writes, I quote, Gandhi forgets in the urgency of his vision that the very spinning wheel he loves is also a machine and also unnatural. On his principles, it should be abolished. Unquote. This is echoed by others as well. Interestingly, replying to a question whether he was against all machinery, Gandhi said, I quote him, how can I be how can I be when I know that even this body is a most delicate piece of machinery? The spinning wheel is a machine, a little toothpick is a machine. What object to is the craze for machinery? Not machinery, not machinery as such. The craze is for what they call labor saving machinery. May man go on saving labor till Thousands are without work and thrown on the open streets to die of starvation. I want to save time and labor, not for a fraction of mankind, but for all. I want to save time and labor, not for a fraction of mankind, but for all. I want the concentration of wealth, not in the hands of a few, but in the hands of all. Today, machinery merely helps a few to ride on the backs of millions. The impetus behind it all is not the philanthropy to save labor, but greed. It is against this constitution of things that I am fighting with all my might. The supreme consideration is man. The machine should not tend to atrophy the limbs of man." Unquote. He emphasized that machines are useful just where they cease to help the individual and encroach upon his individuality. The machine should not be allowed to cripple the limbs of man. Gandhi's position on machinery does need to be seen in the context of the debate between technology and man. To what extent technology should be used and to what and whose benefit are very important. Gandhi raised this question a hundred years before, but the question still lingers. In three chapters of the book, Partening to Conditions of India, Gandhi discussed the role of railways, doctors, and lawyers. These chapters are not are but extensions of his condemnation of Western civilization and what ills they have brought for India. He was opposed to the railways because he identified railways as synonymous with colonial exploitation. Without railways, the British colonialism would not have got the control that it had over India. Railways take, take out raw materials from the rich, resource-rich regions of India and export them to Britain. In the process, it destroyed the village economy of India and impoverished its masses. It moved laborers to work in colonial enterprises. It was also responsible for spread of diseases, diseases like AIDS. He then castigated the lawyers, the legal profession. The lawyers done the opine. As a rule, advance quarrels instead of repressing them. They do not solve people's problems, but only enrich themselves. They suck the blood of the poor people, suck the blood of the poor people. But the greatest injury that they have done to the country is that they have tightened the English grip. 
it is wrong to consider that courts are established for the benefit of the people. Those who want to perpetuate their power do so through the court. Similarly, Gandhi believed that the English had certainly effectively used the medical profession for holding the Indians. Hospitals to him are the institutions for protecting safe. It is to be borne in mind that Gandhi wrote this in reference to colonial India. What Gandhi was most critical was the colonial institutions, which instead of serving the poor common masses, became institutions of immoral exploitation. Even now, however, one cannot deny the fact that judicial and medical systems worldwide are often beyond the reach of the common people and become source of their misery. Here, I would like to draw your attention to what Gandhi himself said. I quote him, I feel that if India will discard modern civilization, she can only gain by doing so. But I would warn the reader against thinking that I am today aiming at the Swaraj described therein in this book. I know that India is not right for it. It may seem an impertinence to say so, but such is my conviction. I am individually working for the same fruit picture therein, but today my corporate activity is undoubtedly devoted to the attainment of parliamentary Swaraj in accordance with the wishes of the people of India. I am not aiming at destroying railways or hospitals, though I would certainly welcome their natural destruction. Neither railways nor hospitals are a test of high and pure civilization. At best, they are a necessary will. Neither adds, adds one inch to the moral stature of a nation. Nor am I aiming at a permanent destruction of law courts, much as I regard it as a consummation devoutly to be wished. Still less, am I trying to destroy all machinery and mills? Still less, am I trying to destroy all machinery and mills? It requires a higher simplicity and renunciation than the people are today prepared for." Unquote. While addressing the above core themes of the book, Gandhi also dwelt on some issues of tremendous contemporary relevance. The role of newspaper, for example. Gandhi underscores that one of the objects of the newspaper is to underscore, understand popular feeling and to give expression to it. Another is to arouse among the people certain desirable sentiments. And third is to fearlessly expose popular defects. To a certain extent, the people will, people's will has to be expressed. Certain sentiments will need to be fostered and defects will have to be brought to light. When there is so much of debate today on the declining standards of the media, Gandhi's words uh, made hundred years before sounds uncanny. Secondly, he understand, understood the foundation of Indian Swaraj uh, must be based on the principle of inclusivity. His experience in South Africa also taught him this. It is to be remembered that his Indian opinion was published in four languages. Similarly, to a question to the reader question the reader posed, he responded, I quote him, I must remind you who desire home rule, home rule in India, that after all the fields, the pindaris and the thugs are our own countrymen. To conquer them is your and my work. So, so long as we fear our own brethren, we are unfit to reach the goal. Here, the, here he expounded the idea of inclusivity which is still relevant to us. This sense of inclusivity extends to the idea of inter-religious relations in India. He believed that India cannot cease to be one nation because people belonging to different religions live in it. The introduction of foreigners does not necessarily destroy the nation. They merge in it. A country is one in, is one nation only when such a condition obtains in it. That country must have a faculty for assimilation. India has always been such a country. 
those who are conscious of the spirit of nationality do not interfere with one's, one another's religions. If they do so, they are not fit to be considered a nation. If the Hindus believe that India should be prepared, people only by Hindus, they are living in dreamland. The Hindus, the Mohammedans, the Parsis and the Christians who have made India their country and fellow countrymen. And they will have to live in unity if only for their own interest. Gandhi Das had a clear reason of the nature, nature of the Swaraj he was seeking in India. He knew that India was not ready yet for, ready yet for it, but he believed in making all efforts to achieve that. The threat that the modern civilization had posed for the human, human society and which Gandhi so elaborately expounded in him Swaraj is now widely acknowledged. The book, however, should not be read mechanically. It's a polemical text and much of the views Gandhi expressed in it is open to interpretation with respect to its context. Uh, in the book, he opens up a host of ethical issues between the colonizer and the colonized, the dominant and the dominated, the oppressor and the oppressed. The post-colonial era brought such issues into sharper focus across the world. Now with globalization lending to a unipolar world, leading to a unipolar world, such concerns with empowerment and disempowerment, dependency and interdependency have not only gained urgency, but have become more pressing ever before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sharma. Professor Sharma has uh, beautifully drawn the key aspects of the text Hind Swaraj and presented it amongst us. In contrast to the often uh, narrow reading that the text is subjected to, he presented a deeper reading of the views of uh, Gandhi through this text and also the philosophical underpinnings of the views. The text reveals that Gandhi was uh, in fact way ahead of his times and that makes his thoughts and his views all the more relevant to today's day and age. With this, I move on. Thank you, Professor Sharma. Uh, with this, I uh, move on to our next session. Our next uh, talk is by Professor Debarshi Prasad Nath. A brief introduction about Professor uh, Debarshi Prasad Nath. He is currently a professor at the Department of Cultural Studies, Tejpur University. Professor Nath's teaching and research and outreach have all been very interdisciplinary. While he has been teaching cultural studies at Tejpur University for more than 11 years now, he earlier taught English literature at Rajiv Gandhi University at Arunachal Pradesh in another state at Northeast uh, India for 10 years. Professor Nath's teaching and research interests have been spread over literature, translation, culture, films, media, cultural theory, apart from the intellectual and cultural traditions of Assam and India. But in all these, his intellectual pursuit has been consistently oriented towards finding patterns of continuity across cultures and societies while recognizing the differences. He has collaborated with colleagues at the Department of Cultural Studies in Tejpur University to lead important social intervention projects for the assertion of mm -hmm. ethnic identities of Northeast India. Professor Nath feels deeply committed to his life as a teacher of cultural studies and aspires to make use of this position to make meaningful and constructive contributions to society. Today, he will be talking about reading Gandhi today. I request Professor Nath to kindly make his presentation. Over to you, Professor Nath. Thank you, uh, Namami, respected Vice Chancellor, Lord Rana, uh, Professor Fraser, Professor Satish, Professor Sharma, my teacher, and uh, members of ICC Belfast and their participants. Am I audible, Namami? Is my voice coming through? Yes, yes, sir. You're audible. Thank you. So good afternoon to our colleagues in Ireland and good evening to friends and colleagues in India. At the outset, I take this opportunity to thank the Government of India and the University Grants Commission for taking measures 
to further widen the scope and reach of Gandhian thought and philosophy globally by organizing webinars of this sort. Secondly, I thank my university administration for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts with all of you today. To me, the most interesting and the most compelling and indeed the most original dimension of the phenomenon called Mahatma Gandhi was his amazing ability to integrate the rare ability to combine or collate separate ideas so as to create a harmonious interrelated organic whole. But it is this quality that helped him to connect the different strands of his philosophy and his life which in turn was, of course, inseparable from his philosophy. I just used the word original with reference to Gandhi, but I'd like to qualify the sense in which I'm using it. Uh, he was not necessarily original in the technical sense of the word, because his ideas are, as we are aware, uh, taken from different sources, and as he himself said, these were more ancient than the hills. Gandhi's originality lies in his being able to apply different ideas and experiences that he gathered and synthesized in life and come remarkably close to overcoming the sense of alienation that I want to talk about that marks contemporary life, probably closer than most other thinkers of the recent past that I can think of. There is in Mahatma Gandhi a deep sense of being at home in the world. There is also a profound sense of being connected to life in all its diverse forms. This ability allowed Gandhi to absorb and reconcile even apparent contradictions and differences. And this also allowed him to freely access and learn from the best that is known and taught in the world. It was this spirit of soaking in the best that one finds truly exhilarating, particularly in the 21st century, for this has become increasingly difficult in our times. Uh, it was this spirit, for instance, that allowed him to inculcate the profound sense of empathy and the ideal of uh, devotion that we find being celebrated in the presence of Narsin Mehta or Shamal Bhatt that was sung in the temples of Gujarat where he accompanied his mother as a little child back in the later half of the 19th century. It was this zeal and this spirit that inspired the Mahatma to incorporate the philosophy of Ahimsa from his Zen guru, Sri Rai Chan Bhai. It was the same spirit that allowed him to learn from the Buddha of Edwin of Arnold, the Socrates of Plato, or the Muhammad of Carlyle. Uh, from Tolstoy, he learned love for humanity, and from Ruskin, he of course learned dignity of neighbor. If Emerson taught him the importance of pristine rural life, Toro gave him the mantra of civil disobedience. If he learned the healing power of suffering from the New Testament, particularly the Sermon on the Mount, he learned from Vedantic philosophy that all living beings are united and thus Violence against the other is ultimately violence against itself. From the Vedas, Upanishads, and Puranas, he learned the idea of rejoicing in God through renunciation. Uh, truly, it must be said that almost nothing human was alien to him. It is probably a natural tendency in man's nature to seek harmony in contradiction. However, there are impediments in the way of uh, this self-realization. And if one looks at the history of mankind, these impediments one finds are relatively recent. Overcoming these impediments require a certain openness to life, which we are increasingly in danger of losing. In fact, the ability to connect between the worldviews of the diverse populations of the world can only come about with the help of a fully coordinated sensibility of a comprehensive soul. I hear people, they say sometimes that they find Gandhi a difficult thinker to understand because they say different things at different times. But I believe that this difficulty 
uh, has to do a great deal with the fact that very often our own thinking in modern times is quite confused. We like to be able to quickly categorize everything and everyone under neat categories. And once this is achieved, we consider it to be a job well done. Uh, interestingly, we have even managed to compartmentalize even our demands for justice, for instance, environmental justice, ignoring how things are interrelated. This compartmentalization was probably what Gandhi resisted the most. Our inability to understand Gandhi is because we tend to dissect him into pieces, as we see him in part. And we see him sometimes as a humanist, we see him as a politician, we see him as an environmentalist, or as a pantheist, or sometimes even as a feminist. The fact of the matter is, he was all of these, and more. I believe that this is where Gandhi continues to be relevant for us. He is one of the few uh, recent modern thinkers to be able to present us with a comprehensive and integrated way of life, where all our diverse experiences of being human blend into one another. Let me just take a brief detour here to highlight the fact that the malady of modern civilization that Gandhi discerned and that Professor Sharma just talked about reflected actually a common way of thinking in the 19th or even the early part of the 20th century in the West, even though today it does not figure in our academic discourses as frequently. I was reminded when I was doing this about uh, what D. H. Lawrence, the British novelist, had once said in a different context altogether, that the average Englishman of his time, and he was talking about the early part of the 20th century, looks at a nude as either an object of intellectual contemplation or as simply a naked woman. T. S. Eliot uh, famously described this schism. He, of course, did not talk about Lawrence in this sense, but he talked about this phenomenon as the dissociation of sensibility, the inability of the modern poet to think and feel at the same time. Uh, I think Max Weber's notion of disenchantment or the desacralization of nature is loosely relatable to this. By unification of thought and feeling, Eliot would have meant, I am saying Eliot would have meant because Eliot never actually uh, used the term unification of thought and feeling, but what he could have meant has been put beautifully by Basil Willey, who says, it's the capacity to live in divided and distinguished worlds and to pass freely to and fro between one and another, to be capable of many and varied responses to experience instead of a few stereotyped ones. Most thinkers generally tend to agree that what Eliot referred to as the process of uh, dissociation of human faculties uh, set in around the 17th century in Europe. Before this happened, it was usual to find a scientific man being able to thrive in his religious faith. So the major interest of life, like science, religion, and poetry, were not yet assigned to specialists. This is the broad argument that I'm trying to make here. It was an age in which bishops and beads could still write excellent secular poetry. Uh, John Dunn, the poet whom Eliot cites as an example, was himself a dean. So the distinctions were only just about beginning to be made, which in the present age have resulted almost in the complete separation of poetry from science, fancy from judgment, of emotion from intellect. But this was precisely the reason why I believe Gandhi thought that India should not follow the Western model of development. He was, of course, one of those who could connect the gap between thought and feeling, and by extension, the gap between intellectualism and spirituality. Indeed, it must be said that for Gandhi, there was never a gap between these aspects of our life. Thus, it was possible for him to speak in a language, an idiom that the common man of India could understand and follow. Unfortunately, in the world at large, today, this gap is only increasing. But working this way, Gandhi was able to bridge the gap between the Indian intelligentsia and the masses. His example ensured that uh, many elitist uh, leaders were morally obliged to wear homespun clothes and identify more with the Indian masses. 
Gandhi, of course, had great faith in the essential goodness of man. The basic Gandhian premise is that man is good at the core. And much of what he said would make sense once we understand this. Vinoba Bhabe used the beautiful metaphor of a cabbage to explain human nature in the Gandhian sense. The outer leaves of a cabbage may have rotted, but it still retains freshness in its core. Gandhi saw the moral progress of the individual as an inevitable evolutionary process. There is innate nobility even in an ignoble man. And that was the reason probably why he wrote that letter to Hitler before the start of the Second World War. Gandhi's philosophy was thus oriented with making man better than he was. This was the ideal route towards real independence. Political independence was only a step towards this real independence or Swaraj. Gandhi's aim was to help people be at peace with their own nature. Thus, as the philosopher Akhil Bilgrami says, Gandhi's search was truly the search for the unalienable life. This can be understood when one looks closely at the events of the court on the only occasion when Gandhi was tried in a British colonial court. But this was in March 1922 when Gandhi was arrested and tried by the colonial government for his leadership of the non-cooperation movement. And Gandhi tried to prove to the British judge that he was alienated from his own true nature and that he was waging a war against his own moral inclination. What started as a trial for Gandhi ultimately became a trial of the British court in India. So Gandhi threw the gauntlet back as uh, Lord Diku Parekh uh, puts it wonderfully well. He says this, that, you know, Gandhi pointed out that there must have been something profoundly wrong in a system of rule which required the interpretation of the likes of him. Lord Parekh goes on to say that Gandhi ended his argument by presenting the judge with a moral dilemma. If he approved of the prevailing system, he had a duty to inflict the severest penalty on Gandhi, and if he felt uneasy about the letter, he had a duty to condemn the system and resign. The British judge, of course, also rose to the occasion. He bowed to Gandhi, we are told, and he remarked that he was in a different category from any person he had ever tried or was likely to have to try. And this is a good example, I feel, of the way in which Gandhi tried to prove how the modern system alienated the individual, making him or her do things that are against his or her true nature. Uh, Gandhi's philosophy of nonviolence was the philosophy of integration. Thus, nonviolence must be understood as a comprehensive whole. It's not something that one can do in bits and pieces. It's a way of life as well as a means of resistance. And Gandhi was ever expanding his philosophy of nonviolence to make it more and more inclusive so that it could speak truth to power and be made applicable uh, for a global audience. But to start with, it had to be inclusive, not just for the other, but for oneself, so that it could help to connect and integrate the many strands of the individual's experiences. Gandhi therefore tried to create a framework for Ahimsa that would help to connect all his experiences of life. An integral aspect of the Gandhian concept of Ahimsa was modesty and uh, humility. This also included humility even about one's own truth. Humility about holding on to one's own truth, of course, does not mean that one should not resist those with whom one disagrees. Resistance is not criticism but uh, because it can be done with a pure heart. With an impure heart, one can only make instrumental use of non-violence, not really make it a part of one's life. Uh, Satyagrahi can integrate the philosophy of Ahimsa with his entire being. Even with regard to our moral values, we should not be critical of those who do not agree with us. Instead, we must resist them. But the point is, how does one do this without uh, being critical of others? How does one get one's message across without resorting to violence? As Akhil Bilgrami explains, one can get one's message across through examples. And in this, one would be guided by consigns and not principles. Principles have the potential to lead to conflict, but are consigns 
allow us to set examples without coming into conflict with others. Others may not follow my example, but I should be okay with that. It's not the same thing as a breach of a principle. At most, I may feel disappointed by the fact that others do not choose to follow me. But I'll not feel the moral obligation, or moral or otherwise, the obligation to impose my truth on others. So the true Satyagrahi tries to set up moral examples for others to follow, believing, finally, that if I do good, others will follow. To conclude, learning from the best that is known and taught in the world involves being able to interpret these ideas in our life. There is still the classic case of examples being better than precepts. That gem of folk wisdom, which still holds good in this age of post-truth, for Gandhi, the truly unalienated life is a life of harmony of the forces within and without. Harmony in nature is based on an extremely delicate balance of interrelatedness and interdependence between all the constituent elements. And like Niranjan Ramakrishnan says, today the first class passengers of the spaceship of Earth are making demands which are simply not sustainable any longer without destroying the whole spaceship. We need to move forward with an understanding of Sarvodaya, which I broadly interpret as being about the interrelatedness of all forms of life. In this regard, one is reminded of the song that was popularized by the American civil rights activist Paul Robeson. We are in the same boat, brother. If you shake one end, you're gonna rock the other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Your talk was very uh, thought, thought invoking and very inspiring. Actually, uh, when I was listening to you, one thought occurred to me that Gandhi was truly a deep ecologist. I mean, the theory of deep ecology was drawn from the way Gandhi lived. All the tenets and principles are based on the Gandhian way of life. And no matter how many, there are people who criticizes the tenets of deep ecology, thinking that they are very abstract, but uh, no one can deny that these are the principles which we'll have to fall back on if we really want to see a sustainable future. So thank you very much. It was a very uh, enlightening speech. So with this, we move on to the next speaker. We have Dr. M. Satish Kumar with us. He is an internationally recognized social scientist and is the former director of Queen's Academy, India. He is a fellow of the Senator George J. Michel Institute for Global Peace, Security and Justice. He teaches in the School of Natural and Built Environment, Queen's University, Belfast, since 2000. He is a visiting professor in UNESCO Malvia Center for Peace Research at Banaras Hindu University. He has held several positions in universities across the globe and has more than 32 years of experience of teaching and researching in the higher education sector in India, Cambridge and Belfast. He was awarded the Queen's University Teaching Award in 2014, which is this award is actually nominated by the students out of 1,175 academic staff. He was presented with the Bhu Vigyan National Leadership Award for contributions to the population, environment and development studies, India in 2002, and the SGI Merit Award for Peace and Culture Japan in 1992. He successfully coordinated the launch of the major international exhibition, Gandhi King Ikeda Peace Builders Exhibition at Queens in 2005. He also successfully coordinated the annual QUB India Lecture Series between 2008 and 2011 and the first joint venture of Irish and Indian poets in India, in Delhi, Hyderabad and Kolkata at 2010 with Lord Rana. He established the Young Civic Leaders of Northern Ireland in 2014. He is a former chair of Art ECTA and is involved in several charity organizations and also civil society organizations. He was a founding member of the Royal Irish Academy National Committee of Future Earth Ireland and is a member of Peer Review College for AHRC and Newton Global Challenge Fund. He is a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, fellow of Higher Education Academy and a member of the Royal Commonwealth Society. 
He has published extensively across multidisciplinary themes with a global perspective. It's my pleasure to welcome you here, sir. And we are very honored to have you with us. I request you thus to make your presentation now. Over to you, sir. Sir, you have to unmute yourself. Satish. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, thank you very much. In fact, I'm uh, really excited to see all of you here today and for your patience. So um, I'm based in Northern Ireland, but I've been in India for the last eight months because of a sabbatical. So um, being the last speaker, I thought I would try to pre present a perspective on, on, my, on my understanding of Mahatma Gandhi and the title of my talk is The Seeding of Swarajya, Reflections in Time. So I want to take a bit more time to understand how this concept of Swarajya emerged as part of my larger work on decolonization. And I'm going to try and stick to the script to enable you to get some perspectives, which is hopefully will be new in the way I dealt with it. So uh, I start with this quotation, the Swarajya is my birthright and I shall have it. Tilak, Lokmanya Tilak, uttered these words in 1916, when a pact was agreed between the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League. This statement became a mantra for the future deliberations towards attaining full independence for India. Tilak was called the father of Indian unrest by Sir Vincent Chirol. Gandhiji called him Lokmanya and the maker of modern India. Mahatma Gandhi said, truly, to revere the memory of a person is to achieve his life's purpose. Truly, to revere the memory of Bal Gangadhar Tilak, whom India delighted and still delights in calling Lokmanya, must be to establish Swarajya and thus forever perpetuate his memory. For this purpose, Gandhiji collected the biggest fund ever raised by the people of India during the last 150 years ago. The Tilak Memorial Swarajya Fund will go down in posterity as a unique event in the history of this country. By doing so, this acti activity will no doubt perpetuate the name of Lokmanya, but also of Mahatma Gandhi. The soul of Mahatma, the soul of Lokmanya will never rest in peace unless and until Swarajya is established in India. It will be born again and again if need be in this holy land of the Rishis until its high purpose is accomplished. This is the statement Gandhiji made about Lokmanya Tilak. And what I intend to do today in the next couple of minutes that I have is to understand how Gandhi's ideas of Hind Suraj emerged out of Tilak's perspective about an aspect, a story, a narrative that we have forgotten, the interconnections between these two incredible individuals. So in, the, in writing an obituary in the young India after Tilak passed, Gandhiji says the following, Lokmanya Bal Gangadhar Tilak is no more. It is difficult to believe of him as dead. He was so much part of the people. No man of our times had a hold on the masses that Mr. Tilak had. The devotion that he commanded from the thousands of his countrymen was extraordinary. He was unquestionably the idol of his people. His word was law among the thousands. A giant among men has fallen. The voice of a lion is hushed. What was the reason for his hold upon his countrymen? I think the answer is simple. His patriotism with a passion. With him. He knew no religion but love of his country. He was a born democrat. He believed in the rule of majority with an intensity that fairly frightened me. But that gave him his hold. He had an iron will, which he used for his country. His life was an open book. His tastes were simple. His private life was spotlessly clean. He had dedicated his wonderful talents to his country. No man preached the gospel of Swaraj with the consistency and insistence of Lokmanya. His countrymen therefore implicitly believed in him. His courage never failed him. His optimism was irrepressible. He was hope, he had hoped to see Swaraj fully established during his lifetime. If he failed, it was not his fault. 
he certainly brought it nearer by many a year. It was for us who remained behind to put forth redoubled effort to make it a reality in the shortest possible time. Lokmania was an implacable foe of the bureaucracy. But this is not to say that he was a hater of Englishmen or English rule. I warn Englishmen against making the mistake of thinking that he was their enemy. I had a privilege of listening to an impromptu learned discourse by him at the end of the last Calcutta Congress on Hindi being the national language. He had just returned from the Congress Pandal. It was a treat to listen to his calm discourse on Hindi. In the course of his address, he paid glowing tributes to the English for their care of the vernaculars. His English visit, in spite of his sad experience in English juries, made him a staunch believer in British democracy. And he even seriously made an amazing suggestion that India should instruct, instruct it on the Punjab to a cinematograph. So you can see that this obituary brought together this incredible knowledge about a man that we have forgotten, Bal Gangadhar Tilak. And despite all of these adulations from the father of the nation, there was a clear divergence on the form and shape regarding Swaraj Swarajya as desired by Tilak in comparison to Gandhi's in Swaraj. And I want to show the divergence and the convergence between Tilak's Swarajya and Gandhiji's Hind Swaraj. That's for a few seconds I want to take that. The preponderance of Gandhi's Hind Swaraj over the Tilakian Swaraj presents an interesting counterpoint in the seeding of the concept of self-rule or home rule or indeed Swarajya. We forget the Hind Swaraj received its iconoclastic status because of Tilak's incredible and insightful articulations on the concept of Swarajya. There is a point of view as expressed by scholars that much of Gandhi's writings were devoted exclusively to us neutralizing Tilak's domination in the Indian polity for the first two decades of the 20th century. At the same time, there's a clear evidence of convergence of their thoughts and ideas as we proceed to the decades from 1907 to 1920. A few thoughts on Swarajya to Hind Swaraj. The earliest reference to Swarajya was in the Constitution Bill of Constitution of India Bill 1895, also referred to as Swarajya Bill. It was conceived of and written during the nascent rise of Indian nationalism. It called for self-governance of Indians by Indians, albeit within the British Empire. Any peasant seems to suggest that the document was influenced by Bal Gangadhar Tilak, who was the force behind calls for Swaraj. The next time the Swaraj or self rule comes into circulation was from the presidential address of Dada Bhai Naroji in Calcutta session in 1906. At that time, there was a divide between the moderates and the so-called radicals or extremists in the National Congress. Thus, the Calcutta session of 1906, the Swarajya became the goal of Indian people. There was a bit of politics played by the moderates at this time. They were no means, they by no means wanted to be tagged as radicals. They toned down the resolution and called it self-government, which meant obtaining self-governing status in a British colony. Hind Swaraj, or Home Rule, on the other hand, was written by Mohandas Gandhi, as my previous speaker, Professor Sharma mentioned, two years later written two years later in 19, 1909 on his trip to South Africa. And this book was banned in 1910 by the British government as being a seditious text. Gandhiji used the term Hind Swaraj, which for him had a distinct connotation. When the son of Dada, Dada Sahib Kharpade asked Gandhi what he meant by Hind Swaraj, Gandhiji said, Swarajya was an independent capacity to sustain or to bear with. The youth was confused with Gandhiji's answer and said, if Swarajya is not going to give us anything in the form of rights, then what's his use? It is, if it is only meant to suffer, what's the point? Gandhiji substituted the word Swarajya, or self-government, with his interpretation on Swaraj in 1910. However, for Gandhi, Swar sovereignty was a very different concept. So let me take some examples of Swarajya as deployed by him over the course of his life. For Gandhi, 
Swarajya involved reform of the self, the individual self, and the duty to oneself that enables one to serve others. He was always questioning the very idea of sovereignty. Big difference in how we understand the notion of sovereignty. Gandhiji also used the term Swaraj for home rule or self-government for the Indian people. But he makes it clear that there is a symbiotic relationship between Swaraj as self-rule of individual Indians and Swaraj as home rule or self-government for the Indian people. In other words, home rule that the Indian people would achieve would be true only to the extent they are successful in being self-ruling individuals. He introduced the concept of organic Swaraj for the kingdom of heaven upon the earth. In his work, Gandhiji concentrated on the achievement of organic Swaraj, heaven on earth, which he called Ram Rajya, or Dharam Rajya. This was to be done while keeping it intact, the genius of Indian civilization. You cannot have Swaraj without maintaining the essence of Indian civilization. And this is one key point that he mentioned. Such a Rajya, he said, is responsive to the people, public opinion and cares for the lowliest of the lowest. That means those who are the poorest of the poor have to be taken into account when we're dealing with this concept. In fact, when the public opinion is free and not artificial, it is truthful. He believed in the power of truth. A Rajya which is built on such public opinion is Ram Rajya. In an ideal state, he said, there is no political power, for there is no state. Drawing upon Pantharu, as Professor Nath has just mentioned. The challenge faced by India at that time was that of galvanizing action for Swaraj, when the majority of the moderates in the party was spouting liberal idioms. Even despite the fact there was brutalness of the colonial bureaucracy in play. According to Maurice Jones, in the political discourse employed by Congress leaders, one could dis discern three distinct idioms, which he characterized as modern, the traditional, and the saintly. All three were deployed in different contexts to win electoral support in urban constituencies. So in the urban constituencies, they used modern liberal idioms. And in the rural context, they used saintly idioms, which in fact was what we see across the board in India. The discourses of Suraj thus oscillated between three extremes depending on the leverage expressed by key players in the field, whether it's Gandhi or Tilak or anyone else. Thus we see a clear demarcation between the so-called secular versus the branded communalist or the moderates and the radicals. The politics of decoupling from the colonial government administration became a call for boycott. The selective disengagement was proposed as self-rule within the framework of British imperial government. What then emerged was an interesting in that Hind Swaraj, as described, was not geared towards issues of governance. Sometimes we make this mistake. We think it is governance. It's not governance. Tilak, therefore, represented the first essential dualism. Tilak echoed similar thoughts much earlier to Gandhiji in his editorial Swarajya Ani Swarajya, dated April 1907. He conveyed his political ideas of Loka Sangraha, uniting people for action, and Swarajya, political self-rule, very clearly. 1907, Gandhiji comes much later in 1909. So two years earlier, he was already ex explaining, exposing the concept of Swarajya. This point of uniting people for action and Swarajya, or political self-rule, or governance, was a key demand of mainstream Swarajas, like Lala Lajpat Rai, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, and Bipin Chandra Pal, who were all deemed as radicals and extremists. And this fundamental difference between Hind Swaraj of Gandhiji and Tilak at all. This paper, as I said, is part of a larger work, which I've been working through. And I was trying to understand that Tilak, as a true champion of Swarajya, how he provided that perspective. The political, spiritual, and ethical divergence and convergence between Tilak, the elder, and Gandhi, the new entrant to the cause of national struggle, is significant. And much has been missed out in the 150 years. The question is, why did we miss this? My contention is that Tilak, the elder, on 
one extreme and Gokling, the other elder on the other moderate end, jostled to secure political space. And the advent of Gandhi and his immediate alignment with Gokhale, who became his spiritual guru, resulted in the gradual divergence from the nationalist perspective of Swarajas, or Swarajas like Lala Rajput Rai, Tilak, and Bipin Chandra Pal. Indeed, while Tilak adhered to the political expediency of Swarajya in the interest of the nation, Gandhi, on the other hand, deployed moral and ethical arguments in securing in Swaraj. Both, however, were, were guided by deep spiritualism and used Bhagavad Gita selectively. So for Gandhi, politics was the handmaiden of spirituality. Tilak, on the other hand, created spirituality to support his political ideals. Thus, Tilak's spiritual epiphany came about when he was incarcerated in solitary confinement in the Mandalay prison in Burma on charges of sedition for six years from 1908. He wrote Gita Rahasya in, Ma in Marathi without the aid of commentaries or commentators. Tilak's concept of Swarajya is based on the Vedanta philosophy. These ideas were presented to the nation as a solution to all the miseries that the British rule had brought to the people of India. He came to the conclusion that Nishkam Karma Yoga, action, sense, attachment or desire, is the ultimate key to life, to live ethically, to achieve knowledge, to achieve progress, both in material and spiritual terms. Gandhiji, on the other hand, focused and enumerated on the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, anasakti or non-attachment to the fruits of one's action. He, for him, the 19 verses of the Gita, he translated them and the slokas into Gujarati and named it Anasakti Yoga or the way of life. Tilak was never mentioned directly in Hinsaraj, but his presence can be felt throughout the text, what Gandhi wrote, which is also seen. In fact, Gandhiji, in, in many of his writings about Tilak, says that Tilak was an impatient party. He represented that impatient party. And I think we need to also consider how each of them work together in that common space for India's freedom. So let me take a few minutes to summarize the key aspects of this divergence and try and link it, this discourse finally, to Northern Ireland where I come from. Okay? What is the connection between Northern Ireland, Gandhi and Tilak and, 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 and India? I want to do that at the end of it. The Swarajya of Tilak. Swarajya as a concept has a long history in Indian context and tradition. Swarajya is a Vedic, Vedic word and refers to self-rule and self-restraint and not freedom from all restraint, which independence means. Thus, freedom from adharma calls for ethical action. Tilak practiced Swarajya as a political dharma. He emphasized verses from the Bhagavad Gita, Karmanya Vadikarastha Mahabhalesu Kadachana. Thus, it is within your control to act, but getting the fruits of your action is not within your control. If you are not successful, you must not be discouraged. This, for him, is Karam Yoga. And this, for Gandhiji, was Anashakti Yoga. You can see the comparison, how both of them converge in the same line. So home rule of Swarajya meant self-respect, self-prosperity, and health, hence self-rule. Swarajya meant for the people, by the people, and of the people. He stated that the science of political ethics is Swarajya. If political theory takes you back to slavery, we reject it. Politics is country's Vedanta. You will have a soul and I will revitalize it. That's what he said to the people of India. He believed that in Swarajya through mobilization of common people, and not just a handful of intellectuals, such a Swarajya of freedom equates with ethics of peace, equality and justice. Thus, freedom is the soul and spirit of a nation. Tilak's philosophy, freedom, he said, is my birthright. Tilak's philosophy of Swarajya is part of securing freedom from the oppressive colonial rule. Swarajya thus became a conscious national movement. He says, only the wearer of a shoe knows where it pinches. Only the citizens of India understand their diverse challenges and the possible solutions. He thus gave four views on Swarajya. 
Firstly, he meant, he firstly said it meant that the ruler and the ruled must belong to one group and one nation. The second view of Swarajya referred to the rule of law, that the state should be governed by law. The third rule, he said government must be elected by the people and must be responsible to them. And finally, Swarajya meant that the, the state should be established for the overall development of the individuals. Tilak paid a huge price to adhere single-mindedly to Swarajya. He was tried for sedition three times, 1897, 1908, 1916. In 1897, he was imprisoned for 18 months in a prison for preaching disaffection against the imperial Raj. In 1908, he was charged for sedition and intensifying racial animosity between Indians and British. Even though Muhammad Ali Jinnah, as a Bombay lawyer, appeared on Tilak's behalf, he was sentenced to six years of imprisonment in solitary confinement in Burma against a controversial judgment. Tilak gave emphasis to Swarajya, political Swarajya, as he believed that securing this would inevitably lead to the benefit of other nations as well. Tilak said, if we insert thread into the needle, the thread follows the needle. Similarly, political Swarajya is like a needle and everything else will follow it. So he went on to explain the, the struggle, he said, was against Lokar Shahi or Nokar Shahi, against the British bureaucrats. This struggle against British bureaucracy is sadly, we find that that bureaucracy, the mindset of the bureaucracy 150 years ago has not changed even in an independent India. And we have to understand and recognize the challenges, the stumbling block that bureaucracy provides to a country like India in terms of its progress. So let me take a few minutes to give you some few insights and then I'll try and wrap it up. So Raja, therefore, was the first All India Political Awakening from 1950 to 1970. And if I look at the whole sequence of the freedom fighters, the luck spent 18 months, almost seven years and six months in incarceration in the jail for his beliefs. Gandhiji spent six years in prison for his beliefs. Nehru spent four years of imprisonment for his beliefs. Patel spent nine months for his imprisonment in the jail for his beliefs. So Vedantic Tilak would declare, if God were to tolerate untouchability, I would not recognize him as God at all. He said, there is no constitution in India, so there's no question of constitutional agitation. So we can see that he used boycott and Swadeshi as a political economic weapons. He encouraged the development and usage of all materials. He encouraged homegrown industries. And that becomes quite significant in the way he perceives and projects it. So the juxtaposition, the juxtaposition of Gandhi and Tilak, and I want to take a few minutes there. The juxtaposition of Gandhi with Tilak is desirable because much of what Hind Swaraj declares and theorizes is prefigured in, in Tilak's speeches. So in a way, when we look at the whole framework, he says very clearly that every Indian should take responsibility for India's freedom. No one else can do it on this behalf. Please consider your own present condition. Your present conduct is self-respectful to yourself and is useful to the nation. Tilak's question concerned the ethical nature of ourselves, complicit with colonialism. You yourself, he said, are the useful lubricants which will enable the gigantic missionary to work more smoothly. He tells people to start disobedience movement even before Gandhi started talking about it. You must consider yourself whether you want to turn your hands to better use for your nation rather than drudging yourself in this fashion. So, at the end, I want to make a quick reference to the links to Northern Ireland. And it is quite interesting that Tilak was accused of being an extremist in one book of the India Unrest, which was published in 1916. Sir Vincent Chirol, a column columnist who worked at that time, was commissioned by the British Empire, the Imperial government, to write a book about 
the Indian condition of India. And there in that book, he accused Tilak of being an extremist who is working against the interest of British government, etc., etc. So Tilak put in a libel case against this very powerful individual and went to London to spite his case, to clear his name and his honor. The person who was fighting, who was raising, who was basically arguing against his case was, was Sir Edward Carson. The incredible Edward Carson of Northern Ireland. And Edward Carson challenged Tilak, accused him, abused his integrity and honesty as a human being. His whole purpose of Edward Carson was to prove that Tilak was an extremist, was out to destroy India and the empire. But Tilak argued this case very powerfully. I don't want to go into the details of the argument. He lost the case. He lost almost 300,000 rupees which was enormous, he became bankrupt. And then Gandhi wrote a letter asking all the citizens of India to contribute to recover the dues of Tilak, a story that most of you don't realize. And he obviously came out of that, that trauma and then went back to rejoin the Congress, the National Congress. He was expelled from there. He rejoined the National Congress and fought for the for the freedom of India until he passed away. So let me make some concluding remarks. The concluding remarks, and this is Sir Vincent Chirol, he says, the man who, who wrote this very unsavory book about Tilak and India. Sir Vincent Chirol declared that he would have avoided the whole litigation by an apology and by a subscription to the Indian War Relief Fund. But in the interest of the empire, he felt that to make an apology under the circumstances of this case or to withdraw or retract what he had deliberately stated in the publish would have been a disaster of the very gravest kind as regards the government of India. So even he accepted that he had made mistakes in charging Tilak to be an extremist and a radical. He talked about the honesty of Lokmanya Tilak. Tilak's profound influence on Gandhi and the future framework of India's freedom struggle needs reassessment and acknowledgement. While both the Tilak and Gandhi started from different positions to secure freedom of India, they applied the ideas around the civilizational and spiritual framework of India. They both condemned the brutality of colonial bureaucracy, the Nokur Shahi, and even today the stumbling block remains in the India's advancement. The institutionalization of corruption endemic to society, where truthfulness remains a misnomer, is a reflection of the fact that few lessons have been learned from the lives of Tilak and Gandhi. Indeed, Gandhi stated, there's no such thing as defeat in nonviolence. The end of violence is the surest defeat. Both Tilak and Gandhi worked selflessly for the freedom of India and their internationalism was reflected in their writings. There was indeed continuing challenges in the realization of dreams of Gandhi and Tilak with increasing polarization of the world into camps where all lives matter. We have to search within ourselves to bring forth our goodness to counter negativity. Thus, in conclusion, I would like to end with Tilak's words. He says, Yada yada hi dharmasya glani bharvati bharat. And what in, in translation it says, Whenever virtue subsides and vice prevails, I come down to protect the good, to destroy the wicked, and to establish dharma. His last important words are reported to have been uttered by him on July the 29th at 1 p.m. He said, unless Swarajya is achieved, India shall not prosper. It is required for our very existence. Thus, Tilak based his political actions on moral choice and dharma or duty. Taking up Tilak's clarion call, Gandhiji, through his personal and particular pursuit of the dharma, through his hint Swaraj, eventually closed the circle to fulfill India's demand for independence from the 300 years of colonial rule. Decolonizing our mind has become more important now more than ever as India looks towards the 75th anniversary of its independence. Gandhiji said, I submit the Swaraj is an all satisfying goal for all times. We the English educated Indians often unconsciously make this terrible mistake of thinking 
that the microscopic minority of English-speaking Indians is the whole of India. I defy anyone to give independence a common in Indian term intelligible to the masses. Swarajya is just that word. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. That was a very interesting session. And uh, your talk was actually very insightful and it gave us a deeper understanding of the term Swarajya, which we often, you know, used to, like I, I can tell for myself very casually, use the term and without knowing the philosophical and the spiritual underpinnings of the term itself. Also, the convergence of uh, Tilak's Karma Yoga and Gandhi's Anasakti Yoga were quite revelatory too. Thank you so much for this uh, timely reminder. And I'm sure, I mean, you have, I can see a lot of questions for you in the chat room. And I'm sure you have inspired us to go back and revisit Tilak for sure, which I personally will surely do. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So, uh, so with this, uh, we have come to the end of uh, the speaker's sessions. And uh, there are a few questions in the chat room. So, uh, what I suggest is, before we take the questions, I request all the participants to write your questions in the chat room on the, on the screen. Before I uh, take the questions, I'd, also, I'd request uh, Dr. Satyavir Singhal, who is amongst us today, to give the vote of thanks to all the speakers. I think after the vote of thanks, we can take the questions. Uh, what do you no. think, sir? No, no, I think it would be appropriate if you take the questions and first uh, and then the vote of thanks. Then the okay. vote of thanks, yeah. Okay, 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 sir. So I request all the participants to write the questions in the chat. Shripad Unde has asked a question to Professor Kumar. What is the difference of political philosophy of Tilak and Gandhi in the context of Gita? <laughs> I'll take a few questions and then I'll come back to it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yes, 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 sure. It would be better than just loving it together. So I don't know. Yes. Yeah. So this is a question by Rajinder Mirakur for all the speakers. Has nonviolence and satyagraha as espoused by Gandhi lost its relevance in today's world with so many conflicts or is it that spiritual leaders like Gandhi come along only rarely? His, I think his question means that whether nonviolence and satyagra has lost, lost its relevance in today's world or that spiritual leaders like Gandhi has stopped coming. There's another question again to all the speakers. Post-independence India, the Gandhian philosophy of non-violence has almost been discarded by the ruling political hegemon. When it comes to amending territorial issues like Indo-Pakistan conflict and Indo-China conflict, how does the Indian political system adhere to non-violence in, in times of gruesome political anecdotes and economic lapses to see a sustainable future? Will the philosophy of non-violence remain as an institutional metaphor for the students? That is a very relevant question. I think has occurred to a lot of people. Another question is, it is a comment. It's not a question, but important nonetheless. Gandhi used politics to understand Bhagavad Gita. Had he used Bhagavad Gita to understand political things, or had he used Bhagavad Gita to understand politics, things would have been different today. Which means Gandhi was not a spiritual man, but a political person posing himself as a spiritual person. This is a comment by Shekhar Mayani. Okay. I think... Uh, no, I mean, can I... Think I... Can I respond yes, to one of the uh, questions? Sure, sir. Sure, I mean, sure. My views on it. Uh, yeah, sure, sir. Uh, that is uh, specific to uh, the question with regard to the non-violence. Uh, because, see, the, the non-violence, what Gandhi uh, meant, it was comprehensive. It was not simply uh, violence in terms of uh, physical injury. 
but violence of all sorts. In fact, uh, for him, non-violence was compassion for all living creatures, which meant which meant uh, that if I, as an individual, uh, I do something which adversely impacts someone else elsewhere, I think that is also violence. And uh, Gandhi's uh, advocacy of uh, judicious uh, uh, use of resources, uh, responsible uh, consumption. And, uh, you know, if you look at his statement uh, uh, about environment, when he said uh, that there is enough for everyone's need, but not enough for someone's greed. So today, when we see uh, enormous problems with regard to the pollution, uh, pollution levels in some countries, or for that matter, this dreaded uh, uh, challenge of this 21st century, that is the climate change. I mean, if you look at the genesis of all these, it is the uh, non-judicious use of resources. And therefore, for me, the uh, non-violence has a wider connotation. Um, it involves, uh, you know, uh, uh, also like uh, equal access. Non-violence means equal access to resources, equal uh, opportunity for everyone. Um, so uh, I think uh, the relevance is not lost, uh, uh, Mira Kursa. It is, it's just that it's uh, interpretation in terms of the physical uh, harm or injury to individuals uh, yes uh, there are there, is, there are areas uh, in the world where uh, the conflict is still persist um, some people do employ violent means to achieve what they believe in uh, but uh, as someone has said that the violence would never lead to a permanent solution it only it's, it's, it may give you some temporary relief, uh, but the the main issues or problems of the conflicts will continue to uh, you know uh, would fester. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, anyone else uh, would like to respond to the questions? Especially the question by Devapriya Borwa. I think uh, she has asked a question which uh, I myself have faced a lot many times from my students here. When it comes to amending territorial issues like Indo-Pakistan conflict or international conflict, where does the philosophy of nonviolence stand? Does it just remain an institutional metaphor for the students? Namami, can I just come in? Yes, sure, 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 sir. Just like to take that, uh, respond very briefly to what Devo Priya has asked. You know, the thing about uh, thinkers like Gandhi is that uh, you know, the, he has already made a difference to the world. Can't we accept that? I mean, it, it has taken us uh, how many years, thousands of years to again bring Nokuban back to focus, back to attention. I mean, he was not alone, of course, there's a long history. That. But then, you know, the very fact that uh, we are talking about it, the very fact that these questions are being raised, means that we are on the right track. You know, Gandhi himself had said something very interesting about this. He had a great uh, understanding of uh, the very humble kind of contribution that he was making in the context of the overall history of human civilization. He said, we are the specs in the history of time. We are just specks in the history of time. So he said, if Lord Buddha couldn't make a difference in 2,500 years, how do you expect change to come overnight? I mean, we tend to overvalue the importance of our own times probably. Change will come. I mean, we must keep that optimism going, I believe. And of course, the change will begin, as we say, with us. I mean, how properly am I probably doing the things that I'm supposed to do? That's very it Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, there is another question 
Gandhi's resistance is considered as passive when compared to Fanon. What do you think about it? Gandhi, the last point, the last part of the question, you said something. Can you repeat it? Said Gandhi's resistance is considered as passive when compared to Fanon. What do you okay. think about okay. it? Your comments, yes. Both of them had very different approaches <laughs> actually Correct. to colonialism, and uh, therefore Gandhi and Fanon would be very different from uh, Gandhi's approach. That is quite evident on the question itself. Uh, sir, can I go back to uh, you, Kumar, sir? Yeah, yeah. The question to you. Yeah. What is the difference yeah. of political philosophy of Tilak and Gandhi in the context of Gita? Yeah. In fact, uh, is it within the context of Gita, the emphasis has been, I mean, Gita was used, if you look at Gandhi, Gandhiji used the moral force, the moral imperatives of politics. And that's why for him, for Gandhiji, politics became a handmaiden of spiritualism. So spiritualism dominated his worldview, his perspective, but we never gave credence to that. We always looked at it from a unidirectional perspective. On the other hand, Tilak was much more of a, as I said, a person, a political animal, because he was determined that he needed to get quick answers. He could not tolerate the inequality that he saw around him. And at that point of time, he used his own uh, philosophy, his own perspective to advance his ideas of politics. Political Swaraj himself was very important. So, one of the questions that was asked is that, you know, what is the relevance? What is political satyagra? How does it make it happen? He makes it very clear in terms of the political satyagra that he emphasizes the importance. He said, political goals along with social goals, if you don't achieve social goals and just as acquired political goals, you do not have independence, you do not have Swaraj. And we see that across the world. Historically, almost all the revolutions, that is the Nicaraguan revolution, the Russian revolution, you look at all the revolutions, most of them achieved political goal, but did not achieve social revolution. Society was totally unequal. And there are, uh, I, I didn't have the time to go back to Tilak's explanation of how even in those areas where, see 1919, please understand, 1919 was a momentous occasion in the world politics. The Russian Revolution transformed the way it looked at the world, the role of capitalism, the role of imperialism. But it did not change. And he said that the people remained subservient to the political leaders. So this shift, this understanding of Swarajya is far deeper. The meaning of Swarajya is far deeper because it is imbued with the, the, the moral imperatives that Gandhiji led by his own experiments with. And at the same time, you had Tilak moving in the direction before Gandhi, trying to establish the ideas of Swadeshi. What we today talk about, Atman Nirbhar Bharat, is actually is a derivative of what Tilak did in 1897 when he demanded the boycott and the Swadeshi movement. So there is a huge history behind it. Sometimes we pick and choose, we don't understand the, the, the emphasis on it. So, yes, as I said, political Stiagra had much deeper connotations about what it meant, what it truly meant. But as a, the last part I would make is that social reform, social uh, Swarajya is as important as political Swarajya. Yes, thank you, sir. So there are several questions, uh, I think, by our participants. Yeah. Uh, one question talks about what would be the leadership qualities that we should learn from Gandhi, what are the other qualities, five things we should learn from Gandhi. Personally, I feel that one should read the original text by Gandhi to understand his philosophy and vision and then uh, choose for yourself because uh, there has been a lot of uh, misconstrued text on the original text written by Gandhi, which had also, you know, created a not so pleasant image of Gandhi. Especially I have, uh, I have observed certain this young generation uh, participants who have certain opinions by reading such text, such a uh, propaganda text. So I suggested to understand a person like Mahatma Gandhi, one should read the original text and understand like Hind Swaraj to begin with or the autobiography 
or like Sajid sir said, you know, again, those uh, texts from where you have drawn those uh, inferences and those, uh, uh, you know, uh, relation between Tilak and Gandhi to understand the philosophical underpinnings of his vision. So I think uh, that is it. I don't see any other question. Uh, uh, Namami, I yes, think, uh, you know, this question perhaps uh, was not answered by me very satisfactorily or to the satisfaction yes. of uh, um, Marikul sir. And uh, as yes, well as yes. there are some comments from uh, Shekhar Nayanil uh, and Deva Priya Barua who asked that question uh, that uh, the Gandhian philosophy of non-violence has been almost discarded by the ruling political hegemony when it comes to okay. amending territorial issues like Indo-Pakistan conflict or Indo-China conflict and how does, or for that matter even in the uh, Palestine and so on, how does the Indian political system adhere to non-violence in times of gruesome political anecdotes and economic lapses to see a sustainable future. I think I would really humbly request our chief guest Lord Rana or uh, Professor Thomas Fraser. Do you think the non-violence has, has uh, lost its uh, relevance in the present day uh, or in the uh, in, in present days um, to resolve conflicts which are essentially of political nature? I think both of you perhaps uh, could May I say? Yeah, please. First, uh, the idea of Satya there holds its origin to Puka 6 in Punjab, who started this non violent movement against the British Raj. And then that idea from here went to South Africa. Gandhi was very much interested in what was happening and he adopted it and internationalized it. So the other is uh, violence, but non-violence, what is the solution? When you become very non-violent against all defense system. So the sixth guru, sixth guru, had two souls and he preached to his disciple, Miri and Thiri. One that is religious, other is to put up. So there has to be a combination that we want to be non-violent, we want to be fair to environment, to human beings, to all creation, as you said earlier. But at the same time, we should know that the rest of the world is not of the same thinking. If you don't have any protection, you'll be overrun. That's what happened in India. Because we became very influenced with Buddhist ideas, and then Sanatan Dharma and discarded all kind of killing where the invaders came and we had no defenses whatsoever, not worth talking about. So India paid the price of being ruled by outsiders for over a thousand years because we discarded use of violence to protect ourselves. So I think there has to be a combination of those. Other matters which is not much understood and talked about. Violence is not just physical violence. When a servant, a neighbor, is not given a fair way, sustainable way, that's also violence against that individual. So violence has different meanings in different contexts. So it's a broad subject. I stop at this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Professor Fraser, would you like to come in? Yes, I certainly would. Um, I mean, my, my stance for this 
raised their interest in a very fundamental question. And I want to believe that there is a role for precisely that kind of philosophy in the modern world. I don't know if people are aware that in our own society, almost exactly a month ago, a great proponent of peace died. A man who worked for decades to achieve peace in Northern Ireland and his basic philosophy was if by striving after peace he could save just one human being's life, then it was worth doing. An interesting comment that he is the only or was the only individual ever to receive the three great peace prizes. The Nobel Prize for Peace, the um, Martin Luther King Prize for Peace, and the Gandhi Prize for Peace. That was a remarkable record, and he was a beacon of hope uh, for a long time uh, so that peace could come to our society. And I would just make one final comment, Will. I mean, this has been a fascinating uh, session, I think, for all of us today. It's been a very rich session in terms of what we learned about Gandhi. And one of the fascinating things for me is that Gandhi opened himself up both to his contemporaries and to those who were coming years later. And I'm sure most of the people uh, at the symposium are aware of the richness of the collected work of Mahatma Gandhi uh, and how he opened himself up uh, to analysis. And that also takes great courage. Nonviolence takes great courage. It also takes great courage to open yourself up in the way that he did. But thank you once again uh, for the invitation uh, to take part in what uh, for me has been uh, a fascinating evening's work. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Fraser. There are yet some more questions coming in. I will take two questions. One is, uh, the how does Gandhian philosophy relate to the concept of Atma Nirbhar Bharat? Okay. Yeah, that, uh, as I said, in terms of the Swarajya, so I mentioned about the role concept of Swarajya and the perspective provided by Tila on Swarajya. So in a sense, when I when I look back in 1897, the boycott of British goes the, the re-emphasis re on going back to your own material uh, culture was something which was emphasized by Tilak in 1897, which has also picked up over the course of time with the civil disobedience movement before the Quit India movement. That's where again you see the, the emphasis on going back to your own roots, to your own culture. So that's the link I was trying to establish. I would really encourage the person who asked the question to also see and read Tilak's Swarajya, Tilak's notion of Swarajya and the whole movement at that period of time. And today I'm not saying that I'm, I'm making the point is that Atma Nirbhar self-reliance is a concept which is a traditional age concept. It's not a new invention of 21st century. That's the matter. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I yeah, think, yes. so just to add to what you said, I think Atmanirbhar Bharat, you know, uh, this morning also we were listening to some of the uh, addresses of uh, the speakers. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, producing uh, items uh, of consumption for the local people using the local resources. So, uh, in that sense, you know, whatever the country needs, if possible, if possible, uh, that should be produced locally. There are, there are a lot of things which can be produced locally. We don't necessarily have to, uh, you know, uh, go searching for it uh, abroad. I, I give an example. Uh, the other day, the Prime Minister in his Man Ki Baat address did mention, you know, about, about the toys. He said India can leverage this huge traditional craft uh, which exists in the country to, to have quality uh, uh, toys. Uh, rather than buying them from outside. So, uh, 
So uh, basically, I think uh, just to answer this question on the self-reliant India, the current pitch of the Indian government is to encourage startups and uh, small to medium-sized industry to use as far as possible local resources and, you know, as the cliche goes, uh, instead of mass production, go for production by the masses uh, for the for the uh, for the consumption uh, within the country, uh, and uh, find innovative products to to address the challenges which the country uh, faces. Uh, Professor Dan, can I come in briefly? Yeah, yes. this is Satyadan and Sin. Yeah. Yes, yes, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. But a very, very small comment, you know. I think, you know, in the context of Gandhi, we discussed, uh, I mean, we heard a lot about Hindu Swaraj. And in the context of uh, Atman Nirbhar Bharat, I think the idea is located in Gram Swaraj. In Gandhian concept, I think, you know, if we, if we do not really see the relationship between the Gram Swaraj, then Hind Swaraj becomes absolutely a superficial kind of an engagement. And uh, therefore, I mean, philosophically speaking, what Professor Jain was talking about is the most, most operational part of it. Uh, in the last 70 years, you know, we have gone through phases. I mean, in fact, we, we know that our economy in the initial 30 years, you know, one of our, one of our goals were basically to become self-reliant. You know, so the word self-reliance uh, is not a new word. In, uh, in our documents, it, have been, it has been there. And uh, import substitution is what perhaps you know uh, one may be one may be indicating, and there there are fairly good amounts of that we failed with it. Whatever is a matter of history, economic historians perhaps would perhaps uh, lay uh, an, uh, I mean comment on that. But just a, just a one small aspect, uh, Satish, uh, you know your your your. Um, your linking of Swaraj with, with the Vedanta uh, is something, you know, which I find it very curious, precisely. Not, it's not a question, it's just a, a thought. Because when we say Swaraj, that means, you know, self-rule or whatever, uh, freedom from all those kinds of constraints so that, you know, one could perhaps become better from the Dean is precisely a, a product when one is to resist the encroachment over one, over the other by the powerful. So that means, you know, uh, there has been this tendency all through uh, of the power, the powerful trying to subjugate the other. And that, I believe, is something, you know, which which is a very profound uh, engagement in, um, in Gandhian framework where he talks about non-violence. And uh, that is, I think, in the contemporary time, just two days ago, we perhaps, you know, celebrated uh, in Washington, people were celebrating under the garb of Black Lives Matter uh, in Washington, the famous, uh, the famous uh, uh, statement made by Martin Luther King, the junior on the 29th. Um, I believe, you know, uh, we got to really see it on a global scale in order to perhaps you know, liberate Gandhi's um, uh, non-violence, both in international relations as well as within our own country, where you know we ourselves have forgotten um, that you know what Gandhi and Father of the Nation um, stood for was la was absence of hatred, you know. But we we have been creating, and that's something you know that we got to really um, uh, remind ourselves. Uh, and lastly, one one comment, uh, just a small comment on on. Um, Two nation theory, Professor Fraser. It was wonderful listening to you. But at the same time, uh, let me tell you that you know all true. Uh, as a student of uh, whatever little political science or history that I studied, we were always talked about. We were we were we were, we, we, we were told about nation in the Western sense of the understanding. You know, the Indian subcontinental nation is very different. Perhaps you know that has not been that has, that needs to be really looked at. Indian subcontinental nation is a, a conglomerate of all kinds. I mean, you have the Santali and the and the Orang coexisting together, yet you know they have their own sense of nation. 
It's not a territorial nationality in that sense of the term. It's not a linguistic nationality in any other sense of the term. It is also imbued by the sense of belongingness and association. And it is there, perhaps, in Professor Jan's remark is very, very important that things that we can really do at our own end with our own local resources. Um, I'm sorry to say this, that in the larger neoliberal architecture, we are losing our water. We are losing our resources to the to, to the forces, not only within, but also outside. Look at what uh, what is being proposed in the name of um, environmental impact assessment. So with these few words, um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are several more questions, but we are running out of time. So I think uh, participants can reach out to the speakers later through emails or, and the link will be also shared in on Facebook. So you can uh, maybe write the questions on the Facebook forum. But uh, in this forum, I think we cannot take more questions due to paucity of time. So we move ahead uh, towards the last session, which is the vote of thanks. But before I move on to vote of thanks, I'd like to make a small announcement because I can see a lot of comments in the chat room regarding feedback and e-certificate link. So the link for the feedback and e-certificate will be shared in this chat room and but the link will be activated only tomorrow at 5 30 p.m the link will be activated for 24 hours beginning from tomorrow at 5 30 p.m so you are requested to give your feedback within 24 hours from tomorrow so we move ahead to the last session vote of thanks and we are very uh, pleased to have dr satyavir singhal the chairperson of india community center belfast amongst us dr singhal is a consultant anesthetist at the royal hospital Musgrave Park Hospital, Belfast Health and Social Care Trust, Northern Ireland. Currently, he is the chairman, Indian Community Centre, Belfast, UK. The Indian Community Centre, to say a little bit about the centre itself, it was set up in 1981 as a voluntary organisation which encourages people to learn about all aspects of Indian culture. Its community development and outreach programs promote integration between the Indian and the wider community. He has been the founding member and board of directors and secretary of Arts Ekta between 2006 and 2012. Dr. Singhal was the secretary of Indian Community Center between 2012 and 2016 as well. So I request Dr. Satyavir Singhal to proceed with the vote of thanks. Dr. Singhal, uh, I think we're not able to hear you. I think there's something wrong with the audio. Okay, audio is problem. You may need to uh, use the earphones. If you use the earphones, maybe you'll get it here. Yes.
He's not mute, no? He's not mute. Sign there. Yes, now you have to unmute. Adi. You can get out and come back again. Try that. You could ask the doctor Singhal to uh, first leave the meeting and then again rejoin. Yeah, I think fine. he has already left. I can't see him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think he's doing just that. He, I think uh, he's. Okay. He'll rejoin. Yes, I can't see him here. He's got his son there, so he should walk. <laughs> I'll just call him and see what's happening. Yes, sir. So in the meantime, while he comes back, uh, there was one question which actually particularly interested me about the uh, about spirituality in Buddhism and Mahatma Gandhi. But spirituality, the idea of non-violence in Buddhism and in uh, Gandhian philosophy. So the question was, now I'm not able to figure out the question, like spot the question in the chat mm -hmm. list. But the question was, what was the difference, if at all there is a difference between non-violence as prescribed by Buddhism and, uh, and uh, Gandhian philosophy? Okay, I think Sar is here. He's going to do it through the poll. Okay.
Hello, Dr. Singhal, can you hear us? But we can't hear you again, I guess. I think Dr. Singhal, I suggest you use the earphones. You can use your earphones. Or maybe connect through your phone. <laughs> yes, I think now we can hear you. You have to unmute yourself, Dr. Singhal. Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you very clearly. Oh, that's very nice. Now, from speechless, I've come to speech. Uh, uh, listening to the great speakers and presentation, and what a great theme. Mahatma Gandhi, reflections from beyond the past and into the future. I'm sure you'll all agree with me that we had a wonderful opportunity to hear the interesting and diverse views about Gandhiji. In this webinar. More than ever, the relevance of Gandhiji has not diminished over the last 150 years, and his contribution still remains distinct and critical as we move forward into this pandemic. I would like to express my gratitude and thank you to the organizers, organizers of this international webinar. First and foremost, to Professor V. K. Jain, the Vice Chancellor of Tezpur University, for having initiated and coordinating the whole program. To our own Lord Dalji Rana for providing insight into his own experience of growing up in Punjab and his own personal reflection about Gandhiji. To Professor Tom Fraser, <coughs> who is a walking encyclopedia of Indian history and his contribution to our understanding the Indian partition. To Professor Chandan Sharma, who in addition to coordinating the webinar with the Vice Chancellor, also enabled us a perspective onto the contemporary relevance of Hind Swaraj, Hind Swaraj. To Professor Devarishi Prashad Nath, for his interesting take on reading on Gandhiji today. My close friend, Professor Satish Kumar, who provided a mirror to understand Gandhiji through the lens of Lokmana Tilak and to help and deepen our understanding of the Indian freedom struggle. To Dr. Namani Sharma, who has broken all the records of breaking the Indian standard time merging it with the British Standard Time, starting exactly in time, and who has been a key moderator 
in this webinar and help in smooth running of the whole program. Lastly, I wish to extend my appreciation as a chair to the Indian Community Center in Belfast for providing us a space to our, to our youth and families of our diaspora to join this significant venture. And a big thank you to all the audience and basically posing with me for, during the speechless time and this pandemic. If this pandemic was not there, I don't think you would have ever been able to see this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. So we call it a day now. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Namanda, you, everybody. One, one small request to you that uh, yes, please forward the emails, forward the emails, or ask the technical person to forward the emails of the experts, professor uh, and the uh, speakers. Uh, uh, Rana Saab, then uh, Professor Fraser, Nath, uh, Chandan, and uh, Satish. Uh, you know, uh, for all those uh, who have asked questions. So, if there are any clarifications, they can directly get in touch with them. Sure, sir. Sure, sir. I'll ask uh, Abhijit to do that. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Satish. Thank, thank you, you, thank you, and Chandan and Namami uh, and everyone else. Uh, you know, for uh, enabling us this uh, this wonderful webinar, uh, and Professor Fraser. Um, it was pleasure listening to you, Rana Saab. It was a pleasure listening to you, and uh, you know everyone. Uh, you know, Satish, Chandan. My colleagues, they were she uh, too good. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank, the, you. All the, all Thank you. 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 Thank